five more seconds. Okay, and we are live. Hello, web shadowers. Welcome back to our final shadowing session for the first week of our spring 2021 semester. Um, I know for those of you who have attended sessions already this week, you're probably getting sick of us announcing this, but we've updated our guidelines a little bit. So you will now have to sign into a Google account to fill out the Google Forms. And those Google Forms have one more question now. So it's four questions and a summary, meaning you have to get a 75% or three out of four questions correct, as well as providing a valid summary in order to get credit for this session. And Web Shadowers is added, adding a marketing position to our team. So if you are interested in joining our team, please create a physician presentation post for us or a previous design you've made and message it to us on our Instagram. As always, please remember the Google form will be posted at the very end in the chat box as well as in the YouTube description. So with that all being said, today we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Stacey Braswell and OBGYN. Um, Dr. Braswell, you can get started whenever you're Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I am, like she said, Dr. Dr. Braswell, Dr. Stacy. Um, a lot of people find it easier just to say Dr. Stacy. And I am an OBGYN. I've been practicing um, since I started residency in 2009, finished in 2013. And so I've been practicing since then. I am board certified by the American Board of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. So I'll just jump in here and get started. Please I want it to be very interactive. So I have a lot of pictures, not a lot of words. Um, so, um, and I can see your comments. So I appreciate you interacting with me as well. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so what we're gonna do today, um, the topics, topic is going to, oh, sorry, is going to be vaginal bleeding and pregnancy. And um, I looked ahead on the web, the, um, Web, shatter, web shadowers site and I think you all have seen a lot of OBGYNs so I'm gonna ha hopefully I can make this a little bit fun I think I threw in some um, elephants or red herons just something that stands out about the cases that we're going to talk about okay so as you if you watch house or any of the doctor shows you know what a differential diagnosis is and so basically for vaginal bleeding and pregnancy you want to basically think across the gamut um, what could it be it is one of our most common complaints in the emergency room one of our most common complaints in on, on labor and delivery as well so you um and in the clinic now i will say that i am a laborist um so if anyone is find finds that they're interested in OBGYN and they contact me i'll talk to you more about that so i do all all of my work 100 percent of my work is now focused inside the hospital and as we progress through the cases, I'll tell you the um, the setting of where the patient presents, because that's going to dictate what your management and what you have available at the time. So the differential diagnosis, and these, this is just a very short list um, for vaginal bleeding and pregnancy is spontaneous abortion. Um, in the medical community, we call a miscarriage a spontaneous abortion. Now, what you'll find is that many people may be offended by the word abortion, so um, it's more commonly called miscarriage. Can anyone tell me from their knowledge um, how far along, what's the limit of gestational age that someone can be for a miscarriage or, or spontaneous abortion? And I'm, I guess I'm kind of trying to make sure my chat box works as well. But um, that, if you know that information, that's that's good. So, what is a spontaneous abortion? A spontaneous abortion um, is basically any bleeding in 
Oh, okay. I'm not going to tell you the time frame. That I'm going to wait until you guys tell me, but it's usually an early pregnancy and it can be considered complete and incomplete just to make it very simple. Um, we also have what we call a threatened abortion. And these people come in, they come into the emergency room in the clinic all the time. And that's just bleeding and early pregnancy. When it's threatened, oftentimes you may, you may have a heartbeat. You may see the fetus moving on ultrasound, however, um, you still have bleeding. And the spontaneous abortion is very common as well. Uh, they're complete and incomplete. Complete means that the uterus has been cleaned out. Incomplete is broken into even more categories about whether the cervix is open, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I see some good answers here um, in terms of how far along we uh, diagnose a spontaneous abortion. And I see 12 weeks, three months, first trimester, 16 weeks, 22 weeks, all very good answers, but you're going to be very surprised at the answer. The answer is actually 20 weeks. Um, so we, anyone who miscarries up until 20 weeks is considered a spontaneous abortion. After that point, we call it a fetal demise. Um, so, okay. Um, number two, in terms of my differential diagnosis, I would say ectopic pregnancy. And the reason why that's really at the top is that in developed countries, ectopic pregnancy is still an issue. Um, however, in underdeveloped countries, it, I would dare say it is one of the um, most common causes of maternal death because an ectopic pregnancy can lead to profuse bleeding. Okay, and we, um, we'll talk more about that. Subchorionic hemorrhage. Subchorionic hemorrhage is also something that we see lots and lots of. It is usually bleeding behind the placenta, and I'll show you a picture of that as we proceed. Um, cervicitis, I'm going to be very general, but if you know what cervicitis is or you know any examples of cervicitis, please type those in, and then we'll return to that. Um, placenta previa, that's a really detailed one that I doubt that unless you're an OBGYN or mid wife or really um, labor and delivery nurses, you will know what that is. And that basically means that the placenta is covering the um, cervical eyes. Okay, so it's covering the cervix. And we have some pictures and things that we'll talk about. So it's really important that the, uh, the baby come before the placenta. So if the placenta is leading, that's called a placenta previa, and that can cause bleeding. And don't ever forget that labor, um, labor can cause bleeding as well. Uh, every woman most likely does something what we call bloody shell, and that's a little bit of bleeding um, as the cervix thins out. So that can be a cause. Um, fetal demise. So, um, so that would be considered um, a, a, a fetal loss after 20 weeks. And that includes maybe like a stillbirth. And those are when your fetus has lost a heartbeat. So that can cause vaginal bleeding, but it doesn't have to. You can have a fetal demise with no bleeding at all. Um, genital tract cancers. So that would be considered more of a gynecologic versus an obstetric cause of bleeding, but cervical cancer, cervical masses, um, vaginal cancer can cause bleeding in pregnancy as well. I added on here pre-labor rupture of membranes because oftentimes when we think of rupture of membranes, we think of a clear liquid, but often, but sometimes um, amniotic fluid can be blood tinged. So pre-labor rupture of membranes would be um, vaginal bleed, can cause vaginal bleeding in pregnancy. And by pre-labor, um, we mean that the person is not in labor. And so that can occur anytime during pregnancy. Um, okay. And then the big heavy, hint, heavy hitter is placental abrupt, abruption. Um, that is a very serious reason for placental, um, for vaginal bleeding in pregnancy. Um, it is, it basically means that the placenta, which I'm going to show you a picture of, has, is separating off of the uterus, okay? And it, and it, that interface causes bleeding and that can lead to fetal death because as we know, the placenta is the source of nutrients and blood for the, um, the fetus. Okay. Let me get better at this. Okay, so here's our first picture. And um, 
earlier we talked about subchorionic hemorrhage. So this is basically the uterine placental interface. If you, okay, um, if you look at this picture, tell me why you, which side you think the baby would be on or the fetus is on and I know that's a really easy question for a lot of you all but um, I just want to make it interactive so would it be on the side of uh, that my hand is on now which is right which is probably or would it be on this side which is left um, and just just a little question I'm going to stop here and answer a question um, and it probably refers to the last slide but I want to make sure I don't miss it it says, why do African-American women tend to have one of the highest rates of maternal death? Okay, um, actually, I think I'm gonna, I'm going to save that question for the end, but um, I promise to remember to cover that question, okay? That is a very good question and thank you for asking that. Okay, so um, I think Sophia has jumped in and given us the right answer, exactly. So my right is where the baby would be. Um, so if I was looking at a um, circle of the amnion, which is the outer part of the membrane, um, the inner side, that right side would be in, in the inside and that's where the baby uh, resides. So this picture just basically has, shows you the just very um, copious and all of the different blood supplies to the placenta um, and so any of these particular areas can have bleeding on the outside, which is, you see the, the uterus. So the myometrium, that's the muscular layer and the endometrium, which is the glandular layer. And there's a layer in between the endometrium and endometrium that, I'm sorry, between the endometrium and the placenta that meet. And that is called the deciduous layer. Okay. Um, okay. Now, bonus points, if anyone can tell me the layer, um, that, well, if anyone can tell me the definition of a defect of the implantation of the placenta, but look, that's very, very advanced, so we want to, if you don't know it, that's fine. <laughs> okay, um, I will give you an interesting point. Sometimes we, even we, you know, medicine in general is a practice, so sometimes we, um, have trouble distinguishing between an early pregnancy and an ectopic pregnancy. So if you look in here, um, and let's see, I can use my arrow. See where it says the main stem of the chorionic villus, okay? If you float the villus, the chorionic villus in water, it will, it will have a tree-like appearance. So that helps us distinguish between miscarriages sometimes in um, ectopic pregnancies. And um, this is the yolk sac. So that's the earliest part of the developing fetus. Um, if you see an early ultrasound, what you're gonna notice is a yolk sac, a gestational and a gestational sac. And then the next thing to, to form would be the fetal pole. All right, and this slide is just normal female reproductive anatomy. You've probably seen this over and over and over again. Okay, so um, I have a response here. Ectopic pregnancy, detached fetus, placental, placenta attached in the fallopian tubes. And I probably have forgotten what question I asked. <laughs> okay. Um, Oh, no. Okay. I, you may have to remind me of what question I asked and which answer that is for. Um, okay. So going back to the normal anatomy, the reason why I'm showing this slide is because it just shows all of the opportunities for bleeding and pregnancy. So I'll start down at the, at the bottom. Remember earlier we talked about cervicitis and cervicitis is considered an inflammation or infection of the cervix, okay? So we have cervicitis, we have vaginitis, and those are most likely associated with things such as gonorrhea, chlamydia, and trichomonas. Um, so those, those do occur in pregnancy, and we, we tend to test for cervicitis at, at the first prenatal visit. And in many high high risk areas, we also test for cervicitis in third trimester. Um, bonus question, can anyone tell me which disease, um, 
let's see. Can anyone tell me? Okay, so when you when you, when a baby is born, we put erythromycin droplets or um, ointment in their eyes, and that is because of a potential cervicitis. So bonus points if anyone can tell me what what type of cervicitis um, that is treating. Okay, so moving forward, um, you see the myometrium here. A woman could have fibroids that could cause bleeding, vaginal bleeding in pregnancy. Um, here you have um, the, endo the myometrium and the endometrium. Remember, we talked about the subchorionic hemorrhage that can occur here. Also, as you travel the fallopian tube, here is the, here are the ovaries, and you can still have um, ovarian cysts in pregnancy. And of course, that is um, the tube is the, the location, the highest location of an ectopic pregnancy. Okay, so um, a per someone responded gonorrhea. Yes, and I agree with that. Okay, some people may um, argue with you chlam chlamydia, but yes, I believe gonorrhea is the most common type of um, cervicitis associated with conjunctivitis for the fetus for which we treat with vitamin E, I'm sorry, with, for which we treat uh, with erythromycin ointment. Good. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. Okay, so this is, now I'm going to go into my case study, and what I'll do is I'll also read the screen, so please, um, as you see, I have this very open-ended, I'd like to talk less and read more and read your responses. So um, I'm going to give you the case study and I'll tell you the where this person is presenting. So this part, and I'm going to explain all the words and things as well. So we have a 22-year-old G1P0. And my understanding is you all have had a lot of OBs come talk to you. So that basically means that this person um, is on their first pregnancy. Okay. So 22 year old G1 P0 and she's at 39 weeks bonus points for anyone who can tell me what the normal gestational age is for um, any pregnancy but 39 weeks so that lets you know she's near the end and she presents with vaginal bleeding. So thinking about what we've already talked about what would be your differential diagnoses. And this patient has came onto the labor floor. So she is in the hospital. She's, she's called the nurse ahead of time and said, hey, this is my first baby. I've noticed some bleeding. Um, what is your differential diagnosis? Okay, exactly. So whoever replied 40 weeks, that is the normal um, gestation of pregnancy. And if you go past 42 weeks, that is called um, a post-term pregnancy. And um, we would like to have you delivered by 42 weeks. Okay. So, okay. So differential diagnoses at 39 weeks with vaginal bleeding would be, would be labor. And so what we'll do is we'll give three. So anytime you prepare for exams, like for me as an OBGYN, I had to do oral exams. So you always want to have three differential diagnoses. Five will be great, but three. So number one, we'll say labor. Number two, um, let's say placental abruption. And number three, um, I'm also, we'll say sexual intercourse because sexual intercourse can also cause vaginal bleeding or vaginal spotting as well. Okay, so what things do you think would be important for her history? And as I, I see that someone typed in hemorrhage and infection, exactly. So when we think about our placental abruption, we think about hemorrhage. So what things would be important for her history? We know she's on her first baby. So we wanna know when did she start bleeding? Um, has her vaginal ble bleeding been going on for several days? Um, has she had sexual intercourse? Does she have any abdominal pain? Has she experienced any trauma to her stomach? Um, has she been in a motor vehicle, vehicle accident? Has she fallen? Okay, good. Sexual activity, yes. Okay, good. Family history, good. Current medications. And movement, very, very, very important. So she, 
um, and someone said movement of the baby, and I can't stress how important that is. Um, you you hear people coming all the time saying that they're not feeling the baby move. We call that decreased fetal movement. And the first thing that we'll run to do, and that'll bring us into our next our next um, category, which is physical exam. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to put her on the monitor. So for this particular patient, she is um, she has not experienced trauma. She has not had sexual intercourse and she does not feel decreased fetal movement. So what we do is we have our, our woman come in, put on her gown and we place, we place a tachometer um, on her and we measure contractions and we measure the baby's heartbeat. Um, let's say we, we get a heartbeat of 140. Okay, so and for in 140, um, does anyone know, is that a normal heartbeat or is that too high, is that too low? Um, now for vaginal bleeding, even at 30, at 39 weeks, we, normally you're not going to do a speculum exam, but if this patient came in at 24 weeks, you'd want to do a speculum exam because highest on your differential diagnoses here is going to be, is going to be pregnant. I'm sorry. It's going to be labor. Okay. And if she, um, if she has um our, if she has a normal AOB, then she's had an ultrasound and we know where her placenta is so we're not as suspecting placenta previa but if she's just a patient who just walked in and she's bleeding profusely don't do a vaginal exam because you can put your fingers right through the placenta okay so 140 that's a good question so i'm going to jump back a heart rate of 140 is considered normal the normal range of heart rate heart rate for a baby is 110 to 160. Again, 110 to 160. And oftentimes, if you do an early, early ultrasound, like six or seven weeks, you may also get a heartbeat of maybe 170, 180, and those would be normal. Okay, so much higher than ours. Okay, great. Um, so for her, we placed her on the monitor. We see a heartbeat. We have our history. We um, get her vitals, of course, make sure she's not tachycardic, make sure her heart is not be beating fast because of the bleeding. And we, um, you know, everything is about inspection. That's the first thing you want to do. So is this patient breathing fast? Does she have ble blood coming down her legs? Does she have blood in her gown? Um, the, is she huffing and puffing like she's in labor? <laughs> I know that wasn't really a medical term, but is she, um, oh, does she have overexertion as if she's having contractile pain? And so um, that's all part of your physical exam. So once you've have, you know, collected your information, gotten your heart rate, um, gotten your vitals, you want to do what's called a, a vaginal exam. And I'm going to show some slides here in a second about more about that. So you do a vaginal exam or what we also call a cervical exam. And you note, note that her cervix is um, six centimeters. Okay. And um, in terms of labs, when a woman comes onto labor and delivery, we normally order a type and screen. So we want to know her blood type and we order a CBC to find out what her hemoglobin is. Um, her hematocrit and her platelets are if she is a if she um if you suspect that she's rh negative and she may have had um, some trauma to her stomach you may want to order another test which tests fetal and maternal hemorrhaging in terms of imaging oftentimes if she's six centimeters you can tell whether or not the head is down however if you have any problems um, finding that out, you can do a quick bedside ultrasound and determine whether the head is the fetal head is down. So how would she be managed? So catching up, this is a 22 year old female at 39 weeks, uh, G1P0 who presents with vaginal bleeding. Pretty much from her history, we've determined that she's in labor at six centimeters. Can anyone tell me what what you want to do? How do you want to handle this patient? Okay, good. CBC, we talked about that. Excellent. And then while, while I'm looking for answers about how you want to monitor this patient, I'm going to go to the next, the next slide, which is just some pictures. Okay. So this is the female pelvis, and I'm sure a lot of you all have seen this at some point in your in your um, path, you know, career or your schooling, training through medicine. Um, and for the female 
and have the, you know, the pelvic inlet, the pelvic outlet. And when we do a vaginal exam, what we're feeling for is we're feeling for the ischial spines, okay? And there are several, there's, as the fetus comes down the, the um, what we call the birth canal, they, they, they do many things with their head and turn twisting, flexing, all of that. But once they l reach the level of the ischial spines, um, then we consider that station zero. And that's where things happen, okay? Um, if, you, if you remember, I don't know if some, some of you are, are athletes or anything like that, um, you have something called an ischial tuberosity that's kind of like on the other side. So ischial spine, and you can actually feel that if you do a, a vaginal exam, you can feel the ischial spine on either side. Okay, so going back to the question about management for the uh, 39 weeker, um, the response was admit the patient, try a normal delivery, and if that is not working, a C-section, okay, uh, wait for the cervix to dilate for delivery and monitor bleeding. All great, great answers, okay. Um, and so what I'll let you know is at six centimeters, we would consider that to be active labor if she has a regular contraction pattern. And so what we do is we can you can do a number of things. You can um, break her water. Um, you can monitor her just to see if she progresses in labor on her own. And before we would do a C-section, um, we would start a medicine called Pitocin. So let's say she got to eight centimeters and for two hours, she didn't change her cervix at all. Then we would start a medicine called Pitocin, which is a um, synthetic version of oxytocin that is um, made in your brain. And if anyone can tell me where in your brain oxytocin is made, that, that's a uh, bonus point as well. And so um, you can start Pitocin. And so we try to do, I try to do everything I can to not take a patient to a C-section. However, um, so yeah, so she's six centimeters. We determine she's an active labor. Our next step would be to do expectant management to see if she dilates on her own or to break her water. Okay, good. All right. And we men I mentioned um, doing a cervical exam. So this is a picture of a baby. Um, this is a full-time baby in, in A. The baby is in vertex, so head down position. And B, the baby is in breech position, okay? Okay, so um, in terms of where oxytocin is made, you guys are really gonna make me um, work for this, aren't you? Um, <laughs> Okay, so there's the uh, anterior and posterior. Uh, let's see, I'm, I'm trying to get my anatomy out here. And I believe, let me see. Um, if you, if, if you, now I feel like I'm on the spot because I can't think of what the P stands for, but it, it's made in the posterior. Anyone who can, oh, there we go, pituitary. <laughs> I'm an OBGYN, so when I say P, I think perineum. So yes, it is uh, it's one of the, I think there's only two hormones that are made in the posterior pituitary. So yes, thank you. Thank you for whoever helped me out there. Okay, so um, the interesting thing about this picture is the, the, the top picture A, as we said, the baby is in anterior, um, is in vertex position and B is in breech. There are three different types of breech. Can anyone tell me why we try to avoid a vaginal delivery with B in breech position? Okay. Um, so the other the, the A is significant because this baby is in what we call, and let me show you. So the different parts of the head, remember this is frontal, um, you have parietal and occipital. So um, we call this occipital anterior, which is the perfect position for a baby, okay? Because under this bone, this pubic symphysis, the head has to flex, okay? The neck has to flex. And so as you know, if you bend your head, it flexes much easier than if you extend your head. So if you, um, as the, the head goes under that pubic symphysis, 
it's going to flex and and then once it gets under it'll extend and be able to deliver vaginally however if the baby is in the other position so occiput posterior imagine trying to flex under that bone oftentimes it won't do it will not flex so many of those babies will go on to a vagin or to a cesarean section um Okay, so okay, so the question was, why do we try to avoid a breach vaginal delivery? So why do we try to avoid delivering the baby via the vagina when it is bottoms down, okay, or breach? And some of the answers we I have are it's dangerous, harder to pull the baby out, or the baby can suffocate, um, can harm the baby's neck, cervix can close around the neck, oxygen supply can get cut off. I like all of these responses. So the number one, um, those are all great. Those are all great responses. Now, what I will say um, is one that no one, you really wouldn't think of unless you're an OBGYN. If you look at the cord here, you see how that cord is kind of descending, but you see up here, that cord can't go get in this spot because the head is going to be the largest part, right, of the of the of the fetus or the or the infant or the baby. Um, so some exact well, there's something called cord prolapse. So if that head is able to get around that that bottom, that's going to and it and it gets caught in a contraction, it can cut off the blood supply to the baby. And I think that harder to get the baby out definitely. So what we know is the largest diameter of the baby is going to be the head okay um and it is a bony prominence so we like to get the head out first because once we deliver the baby everything starts kind of contracting down so it's important to get the head out first so the per person that said um the cervix can close around the 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 neck yes we call that um head entrapment so that is definitely an issue so if the head is not leading then it can the cervix can close down around the neck and then the head can get stuck so that's a good a good observation um oxygen supply can get cut off so that can that can occur if during head entrapment or cord prolapse so that cord coming down first um okay good Okay, so I got the question, what do you do in a situation where the cervix closes around the neck? So um, the, I'm trying, I want to make sure I understand your question. So it, I'm assuming you're talking about a, during a vertex vaginal delivery where the head is down, or do you mean in a, um, in a breach? Um, in a breach deliver. Okay, breach. Huh, that's a good question. So the cervix is starting, it closes. So first of all, as soon as we find out the baby is breached, we go to a C-section, okay? <laughs> that is the correct answer. But um, the we have different maneuvers to deliver breach if needed. So you will ultimately, if you're, you know, OBGYN, you will deliver baby's breach in the, in the C-section. So in the operating room, and there are a number of maneuvers, um, first to get the, the legs out, um, to rotate the body, to get the arms out. And then what you, you take the head and you, you put fingers on the occiput and you flex it. Okay. And that should help get the head out. And so, um, the you can also give medicines to relax the uterus such as um, terbutaline um, nitrous oxide oxide but we don't use that much on labor and delivery but you can give things to relax the uterus to stop the con the uterus from contracting down around the baby's head so that's a good question how do you move the baby out of breech position <laughs> You don't. Okay. Um, so you're going to see a lot of different answers. If you have a, um, there is a, there, we have something called external cephalic version where uh, you have the patient come in and consent them, um, get an ultrasound, do a typing screen and um, 
you can actually try to rotate the baby from breech to vertex. Um, the success rate of most people is about 50 to 60 percent for that. Um, so that can or cannot work. And then you're going to hear some old wives tale um, descriptions of how you can um, revert, a pay, pay, uh, revert a baby from breech to vertex, which is going to be like acupuncture. Um, you, if you Google online, you're going to see different positions. They say you can move in. So, you know, if you do have a baby that's breached, th their best outcome in terms of rotating, it's going to be um, a, a, per a patient who is of normal weight in a patient who has had multiple babies. So, so um, a patient that is not obese and a, and a patient that's what we call multiparous. So they've had multiple vaginal delivery. So they're just going to have a little bit uh, more flexibility. And then we, you know, prefer that the head is already, head is already flexed and not in the pelvis. So um, those are just some things. Okay. That's a great question. Okay. So, we talked about management for that patient in, in terms of labor. And so I'm just going to skip on to our next case study. Um, this patient, so for your reference, this patient is presenting to the emergency room because um, what you'll find is that most labor and deliveries start seeing pregnant women at 20 weeks and beyond. So any patient that is less than 20 weeks and it's known to be less than 20 weeks would normally be seen in the emergency room. Okay, now before I start this, I'm gonna to go to this question that I just got, which is what is your take on water births? And um, and I'm, I'm, I think if a water birth is done in the hospital, it can be a, a good experience. I've never done them. I, I find that, um, some hospitals that do them, the OBGYN has to be certified to do it. And then you have to avoid things such as, um, uh, you know, a patient that's not group beta strep or has any um, abnormal fetal heart tones. So um, I, I think it can be a good experience if for the right patient and if it's done in the hospital, that's my answer for that, okay? <laughs> okay, so going back to case study two, this is a 36 year old G5P4, which means that she's had five deliveries and she's, on, I'm sorry, she's had four deliveries and she's on her fifth pregnancy. She is known to be 10 weeks and she presents with vaginal bleeding. Okay, differential diagnoses, just start typing in what you think could be um, causing her bleeding at 10 weeks. And while I'm waiting on that, I will say that she's 36. So that is what we considered a advanced maternal age, um, also known as elderly multigravida. I know that's, um, <laughs> that's a pretty interesting term. Um, in 10 weeks, okay, so we're thinking, remember we said anything less exactly, so anything less than 10 weeks or 20 weeks, um, if, if it does expose or she has miscarriage, will be a spontaneous abortion. Okay, so our differential diagnosis is spontaneous abortion. Okay, this is a, so someone type placental abruption, and that is really an interesting differential diagnosis, um, or that's an interesting response. So the, if, um, in terms of pregnancy, around 10 weeks is when you really start seeing your placenta form, okay? And so when we have our abruption, we normally see the abruption um, a little bit later in pregnancy, okay? So at this point, if the placenta did, um, did shear off of the uterus, we would still call that a sp spontaneous abortion. Okay, an ectopic pregnancy, excellent. So that's a good, so I asked for three, those are all viable um, reasons for bleeding in early pregnancy. Let's um, let's mark placental abruption down and let's move another one up. So let's say um, threatened abortion, um, cervicitis, and subchorionic hemorrhage. hemorrhage. Subchorionic hemorrhage, you're going to see that on ultrasound all the time. Um, and, it, you know, the ED docs will tell the patient and they'll get all frustrated and things like that. But you see subchorionic hemorrhage all the time. I think out in the world, they may call that implantation bleeding. So I'm not saying it's nothing to worry about, but it's very common. And most people go on to have normal vaginal deliveries. 
Okay, so what the history for her. So our history is going to include um, things that we've already talked about. Um, have you had sexual intercourse? Have you had bleeding before, early in pregnancy? Um, have you, are you, and we talked about medications. Um, okay. And to answer that question, what age? do mothers have to be considered advanced maternal age so that would be starting at 35 so if you have a patient who's 34 and they're going to be 35 when they're they deliver they are considered advanced maternal age great question okay so her history what medications is she on um did she even know she was pregnant so we know at 10 weeks she shouldn't feel fetal movement um and we want to know how vigorous is the bleeding when did it start and this would be a person where you want to do a vaginal exam with the speculum, okay? Um, so that brings us to our physical exam. Our physical exam is going, we're going to look at her vitals. We're going, to in, we're going to actually look at the patient and see what we see in her vitals. You know, is she high, hypotensive, meaning is her blood pressure down because she's having vi vigorous or um, vaginal bleeding? Um, you. And so in your inspection, you're looking between her legs to see how much bleeding she's doing. Um, is she light in terms of her history? Is she lightheaded? Is she dizzy? Does she have headaches? Okay. And so let's say um, on her physical exam, you open your speculum. Um, and I might have to cheat. Let's see something. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So you open the speculum and you see just uh, what we call moderate. Usually when we open our speculum and we look at the amount of blood, we call it mild, moderate, or severe. And so let's say you have, you see a, a moderate amount of bleeding. Um, you do our labs and we already stated, you know, CBC, type and screen. You can do a, a Clyhar becky test. So that's the fetal hemorrhage test, seeing if the mother has bled into the fetus or the fetus has bled into the mother, I'm sorry. Um, and imaging, you're going to order an ultrasound. At 10 weeks, you're looking for that ectopic pregnancy. So you're really looking at those ovaries. You're looking for a fetus and you're looking for a heartbeat. Can anyone tell me at what point, so how many days or how many weeks a heart rate is um, visible on ultrasound for a fetus? I should say embryo or embryo at that point. So that'll be, um, how would a speculum exam work with blood in the way? Very good question. So we have something called, uh, we call them rectal, our proctal swabs. And they are just basically the biggest, the, the largest um, Q-tip you can imagine. And so I just scoop blood out just scoop it out, scoop it out, okay? And, um, or you can take a, a pair of forceps and just a four by four or gauze, sweep it in and take the blood out. So we, we have ways of being able to visualize the cervix, but that's a great question. Okay, um, okay, heartbeat. So this is a really, really, really important concept. And let me tell you why. Um, patients will come in at about five or six weeks and they, you see a yolk sac on ultrasound, you see a gestational sac, um, and you don't yet see a heartbeat. So um, the person that says six weeks is closest to the answer. So um, the answer I give is about 24 days when you start seeing a heartbeat. However, you don't want to jump, jump to any type of intervention if it's seven weeks and you don't see a heartbeat, okay? Because um, their dating may be off, et cetera. So it's a, instead of someone getting really, really worried, what I would do is have them come in for an ultrasound and this would be a transvaginal ultrasound and you'd measure the size of the, um, the fetus, which is called a crown or rump length. And once that, once that crown or rump length coincides with about seven weeks, then I think it's comfortable to say that you should have seen a heartbeat. And once again, there's no rush. You can always have the patient come back again at eight weeks. And if at that point, if there's no heartbeat, then you can definitely say that the, pair, the patient is experiencing a spontaneous, or um, at that point, we call them um, 
we can call it spontaneous abortion. Um, we we'll call it a missed abortion. So a missed abortion is, um, it's a type of spontaneous abortion. It's where the patient hasn't had any bleeding, but they just miscarrying. okay? All right. Um, so our imaging was an ultrasound and management. So um, I'll just give you some information. So this patient came in with bleeding early in pregnancy and one of the things that you asked her was, well, one of, one of the things she said during her history taking was that she didn't expect to get pregnant because she had um, a intrauterine device placed in her uterus, which was supposed to prevent her from getting pregnant. Um, and so that'll bring me to my next picture. So she went on to actually have a vaginal or a vaginal delivery at let's say 38 weeks but when her placenta was pulled out we saw that right there can anyone tell me what that is and um this is this is not very common but it has happened i remember when I was um, practicing in my first job out of residency, I had a patient who kept getting an IUD. And uh, yes, that is an IUD. She kept getting an IUD and kept getting pregnant. <laughs> but uh, the reason why is because she had two uteruses. And hopefully I got that, two uteri. She had two. And so um, when she placed someone placed the IUD, then the other uterus would get, and that's a bicornate uterus. So um, the other uterus would get pregnant. So, so this is not commonly seen. However, it can cause um, problems. It can cause bleeding early in pregnancy, and it can cause spontaneous abortion. Um, I have heard reports of the intrauterine, the baby being born with the intrauterine device in their, you know, in their hand. I think they were probably, they probably made that up, but um, it was in, within the sac, within the the um, the delivery. So, can anyone tell me? And I think this is a really hard question. If a patient gets pregnant with an intrauterine device in place. Should you remove the intrauterine device if you see the strings? So let me let me um, go to the next slide. So if you haven't seen an intrauterine device, this is one of the many forms of birth control. Okay, um, the one on the left is hormonal. So these these IUDs will contain progesterone. And the last I checked, there were actually five on the market. And then this one is the only one with um, a non-hormonal ID and it's a copper IUD also known as Paragard. So um, in the hormonal IUDs, there's, oh my goodness, there's so many different ones, but usually people know about Mirena. I think it's been around the longest. So when you do, um, let's say you do your exam and you she's 10 weeks pregnant and you see the strings hanging from her cervix do you remove it or do you not remove it okay we have a response here that says risky to remove it may cause bleeding um, we have a, something here that says the uh, so, someone said the arms can hurt the fetus okay okay so the interesting thing about the iud the now it may you know it may cause spontaneous abortion and it can cause problems with the the fetus don't get me wrong the arms tend to be pretty flimsy the arms not necessarily the base but um what we're afraid of is it really puncturing the the fetal membranes and causing maybe a rupture of membranes or puncturing the placenta causing bleeding and things of that sort but the recommendation, and if you look at the paperwork, you know, look at the um, manufacturer's um, booklet, they do recommend that the IUD is removed. So if it's an early pregnancy, you see the strings coming through the cervical os, it is recommended, re recommended that you take um, a spec, well, forceps and remove the IUD. Um, I will tell you about an experience that I had um, where a patient had an IUD in place and I tried to remove the IUD. She'd gotten pregnant with it 
and um, it was too painful for her. So I scheduled her for the operating room and it was just for, um, we'll call it a, um, just, you know, removal of IUD. And once I took her into the operating room and her, she received anesthesia, her smooth muscle relaxed, the, the IUD actually came on out very easily when, once she'd been put to sleep. But um, it is something that I would only give, you know, one or two tries and they have to be thoroughly, thoroughly consented on um, the possibility of miscarriage. Okay, so we have a comment here. Is there a higher risk of spontaneous abortion with the hormonal IUD versus the copper IUD? Now, this is my unexpert opinion, but I would say no, um, because the hormonal IUD contains progesterone, which is what the placenta makes anyway. So I don't um, think that that matters. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, so that was pretty much that. That's kind of like a red herring. You really, you, re, you, know, you normally wouldn't see this, um, but I have seen it. I've seen it multiple times. And just note that if the IUD is removed, that is the recommendation. Okay, but make sure the patient is thoroughly, thoroughly consented. Okay, now we'll go on to our last case study, and then I'll see if anyone has any questions. Um, this is in the emergency room because remember we said that when a patient comes in and they are less than 20 weeks they're usually seen in the emergency room first so this patient is a 28 year old g3p0 at eight weeks that presents with vaginal bleeding now by now we know what g3p0 is i want to know what how do you feel about what you've just read, how do you feel about how that guides her differential diagnosis or what is significant about her being a G3P0? What pops into your head? Okay. And as we, um, I wait for that answer, let's just go through our differential diagnoses. Um, we'll give the, t we'll give three. Um, number one, spontaneous abortion. Number two, um, cervicitis. Um, number three, sexual intercourse. I'll keep going. Number four, uh, ectopic pregnancy. Number five, um, fibroid uterus. Okay. So does anyone have any questions about that presentation that really stands out to them? Exactly. So she's had two other failed pregnancies. So you want to know why that is high on your differential, okay? Um, it's not uncommon to see one miscarriage, um, but to see two prior, you're, you're kind of wondering why, and then does that impact why she's bleeding now? So that's going to guide your history. So you want to know what, why did, did she have um, two, um, what we call terminations or DNCs, um, um, did she go in, you know, to maybe Planned Parenthood and have an abortion? Did she um, lose an early pregnancy less than 10 weeks or less than 20 weeks? Um, did she have, does she have a bleeding disorder? Okay. Um, that causes her to lose her pregnancies early. Does she, has she had um, a surgical procedure such as a leap, um, something where her, her, um, cervix has opened up and caused her to lose her pregnancies. You want to know how far along she was with the loss of her pregnancies as well. Okay. So that I will really focus on that with her, my history. And with eight weeks, once again, remember when they're in that early gestation, you, you want to do a, um, you want to do a um, speculum exam. So on your speculum exam for this patient, you are, you just see very scant bleeding, um, and her vitals are stable. She is a tad big tachycardic with the heart rate of 110, um, but she's not horribly normal tensive. And um, in terms of, and you guys can, you can jump in here and, also it's, and tell me what labs you would draw. She's only eight weeks. So, but when we see bleeding, first thing we do, um, CBC, type and screen, 
Um, if she has profuse bleeding, then we may also do a type and cross and get her ready for a blood transfusion. Okay, um, exactly, I agree. So a history of a spontaneous abortion makes another more likely. I agree with that. Okay, and so remember this is in the emergency room. So the emergency room doc has already gotten you your ultrasound. Uh, um, and so you know you have a better idea of what is going on, on for this pregnancy. Exactly, CBC, good. Okay, so let me tell you this. Let's say during, before I flip, go to the next screen, let's say while she's in the emergency room, she's getting up to go, she, well, she's coming back to her um, triage room after getting her ultrasound and she collapses on the floor what out of your differential diagnoses what is moved up on the differential diagnoses um, list i'm trying not to flip to the next screen because it's gonna it's a dead giveaway <laughs> but um so she's become you look at her vitals her blood pressure is now 70 over 30 her heart rate is 130 um, she has pallor, so she's, you know, losing the blood in her skin. Exactly. So ectopic pregnancy. And if you're an OBGYN, you will see this exact example over, not hopefully not over and over again, but you will see this. So what you want to do is you want to get the patient um, in the bed. You want to put them in a tilted position where the blood is rushing to their head to hopefully, you know, raise their blood pressure. And you um are, of course are monitoring her vitals you want to go, go through her abcs you know what's her respiratory rate is she um does she need oxygen um and you just just go ahead and type cross and tell them to start bringing blood because even though hopefully by then you have your cbc back but she's most likely bleeding into her belly okay and we see this a lot um and so the caveat is that if you, I'm going to go, I'll go to, if you have an ectopic pregnancy and your patient is, you want to try to stabilize them, but if they're, if they're bleeding in their belly or they're hemorrhaging in their belly, then you have to, you have to stop the hemorrhaging. You have to st stop the source of hemorrhaging. So you can um, call your OR team, you know, call your anesthesia in, um, your anesthesiologist, tell them to, to prep the OR, bring blood products while you're on your way to the emergency room. So this is just a picture of an ectopic pregnancy. And as we know, ectopic in this case means that the pregnancy is outside of the uterus. And we probably already know that the most common area for an ectopic pregnancy is in the tube. Um, other locations, um, and there's, you know, they have percentages about where each is found, but the ampullary section of the tube is the most common location. Um, very uncommon, you can find um, ovarian ectopic pregnancies, but that occurs. You can find ectopic pregnancies in the interstitial. We also, we mostly call that a corneal pregnancy. Um, and it'll be very interesting on ultrasound because you'll just see the pregnancy outside. Of, it, it won't be centralized. So a pregnancy has to be in this central region. Otherwise, you're concerned for a corneal pregnancy um, or a cervical pregnancy. Okay. Um, and also in a cesarean scar. So if they've had a history of a C-section, um, it can be found there. You can also have abdominal pregnancies. You, a lot of times in old world countries um, on Google, you'll see women who have had abdominal pregnancies. Okay, so the question was asked, can a fallopian tube be saved with ectopic pregnancy in fallopian tube? And my, my answer to that is thank you. Thank you for answering that question because I think we've all heard various um, instances where People have said we, you know, um, a woman cannot terminate an early pregnancy. Um, if it's found in the tube, it should be re-implanted re into the uterus. And that is just not possible. And the reason being is that when when you have an ectopic pregnancy, oftentimes um, the decidua and what would eventually become the placenta is 
within that sac. And so that's a lot of what's causing the bleeding. So you can't, the whole process of implantation, which we know takes seven days, you can't just implant that into the uterus. It has to be an entire process. So no, the fetus cannot, or embryo cannot survive outside of the uterus. Um, now it can be, it can be very, um, you know, you can go, I've had instances where you remove, we do what's called a wedge resection to remove the, um, a pregnancy from the cornua and out comes a full fetus. Okay. Um, but note that they cannot survive unless they're implanted into the right um, location. Um, okay, so is there a risk for maternal death with ectopic pregnancy? Most definitely, yes. And um, from my experience, the, 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 unfortunately, the most um, bloodiest surgeries I've had um, have been from ectopic pregnancies. And you look and the fetus can be very, very small. Oftentimes we're talking less than three centimeters, but they, it, you can have, you can, you can lose your whole blood supply. Yes, in hemorrhaging through ectopic. Um, so if um, there are some, there is a medicine called methotrexate that is a um, anti-metabolite, um, anti, well, it's a cancer drug in essence, but it, um, anti-folate, I believe, yeah, metabolite. So it can stop a pregnancy. And if the person is completely stable, so not like our patient who's hemorrhaging in her belly, hypotensive, tachycardic, um, and passing out, they may be a um, they may be a candidate for methotrexate. So once you, I mean, if you're interested in OBGYN and you get to that point, I'll tell you, there's about ten to twenty indications, <laughs> maybe ten indications and ten contraindications to methotrexate. Um, but she is hemodynamically unstable, so she is not a candidate for methotrexate. And on her ultrasound, um, the pregnancy is located in the tube. So uh, my next slide, so this is um, a diagram of what you would anticipate for a laparoscopic surgery. So um, in order to do a laparoscopic surgery in this instance, the patient would have to be hemodynamically stable. And so since I do not think she's hemodynamically stable, I would take her to the operating room with a, um, for an open procedure, okay, which we call an um, exploratory laparotomy, okay. Um, so this would not be an option. So, but if she was hemodynamically stable, then we would, you could do a laparoscopic surgery. You could, um, and I'm pretty sure you all know laparoscopic is when you use the cameras, monitors, um, and, and you go into the belly and you're able to put it on the monitor and see, um, visually do the surgery that way. And this just shows placement of the ports, um, do an infra umbilical, so under the belly button, a port there that allows you to visualize the pregnancy. And then these are the two that I normally use, okay? And that's gonna be about two thirds the distance from the umbilicus to the anterior superior iliac spine for all my anatomy nerds out there. <laughs> okay. Um, is that with the Da Vinci robot? No, this is not with the Da Vinci robot. And I, I dare say, I don't think anyone's using the robot for ectopic pregnancies. Um, but you may, if you find out that I'm wrong, please email me. My email is going to be on the last slide. <laughs> but the port placement for Da Vinci um, is possibly um, pretty, um, pretty very, very similar to this, but this is going to be your regular 3D laparoscopic surgery. So you, I mean, think about it. When you're in the middle of the night and you're on call and this person is hemodynamically inst unstable, you are, you're, you're getting in there. And even if they're hemodynamically un unstable, most places are not going to wait to fire up the Da Vinci to try to do any procedures. Okay. They're going to hopefully have the skills to do it laparoscopically and um, get the <laughs> ectopic out. So what you do when you first get in is you wanna identify the bleeding. And I remember someone asked earlier, they said, why, why, um, how, how can you see the vagina with all the bleeding? So the same question is here, how can you find the ectopic? Which may be, a, I mean, it may be the, the size of this, 
of my fingernail. Okay. It may be really, really small. So the question is, how do you stop? Um, how do you get in without the bleeding? So we have suction cannulas um, to just basically suck the blood out. And sometimes you just have to scoop the blood out um, with your hands and just keep um, until you find the area. Hopefully your ultrasound tells you what side it's on, but the ultrasound can be wrong as well. Okay. So once you identify the ectopic you want to use um, bipolar cautery, which is what I use. Um, so, you know, electromagnetic energy and, and stop the bleeding and remove. Um, usually the recommendation is that you just only take a portion of the tube that's bleeding. But, you know, if the, if it's, you know, if it's not possible, then you may have to take the whole tube. Okay. So, I think, okay. So I'm gonna open um, open it up for questions. Ooh, I think I talked for a long time, but I do wanna go back and answer one of the questions that was asked earlier that I said I would come back to. And so if anyone has any questions about anything or any feedback about anything that I've talked, to, talked about, please type in below. Okay, I'm looking for that question. Okay, so the question that I said I would come back to is why do African American women tend to have one of the highest rates of maternal death? Okay, so I think that, um, as we all know, we know what health disparities are. We're seeing it with coronavirus in the news today. Um, so health disparities are built upon economic deficiencies um, demographics. Um, one of the things that we also know is that because of what has happened to African Americans in the past in terms of the Tuskegee experiments, um, back when men, African American men in the military, it was with penicillin was withheld from them for treatment for syphilis, although it was available, um, that we tend to, African Americans tend to be less trusting of physicians and the medical community. So I think that along with the fact that there is a higher rate of obesity, um, hypertension, um, diabetes, all of those things together, um, along with unfortunately, physician and medical care bias, um, increase the rate of maternal death in African-American women. So um, access, so access is really important. So I actually practice in a very rural area. I've had, I have the, I have the pleasure of having five medical licenses, um, primarily in the Midwest and Southeast. And I have practiced in very rural areas. I've practiced in major cities. Um, access is very important. So I have a patient that I'm monitoring now for labor who lives an hour away. And access can be, it can be based on how far you are from the, the medical community um, or, you know, the doctor's office. And it can also be based on, you know, do you have, do you have transportation to get to back and forth to the doctor? So one of the things, you know, African-American or any nationality, are you, are you, keeping regular prenatal visits. It is really, really important. I know that prenatal visits can be very, very cumbersome. In the first part of pregnancy, we see everyone for four weeks and then we go down to two weeks and one week. And one week can be the difference between life and death, okay? Um, I've had um, an African-American patient who had twins and one week she just didn't feel like coming. And that was the week that, um, that the one of the twins died. Um, I've had African American patients who did who were um, un, didn't have the best housing conditions, um, and um, they were really young. May may or may or may not have been aware of what fetal kick counts were, and 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 you know had decreased fetal movement, and the patient and the infant died. So, I think to answer your question, it can be access to medical care. Dis mistrust of medical care, biases by the um, medical community, and um, comorbidities. So um, hopefully that's something that will resolve, especially with the Biden administration. But okay, so um, let's see, I have more questions. 
let me go back. Oh, wow, I have lots of questions. You guys are okay. Um, can the body naturally reject the ectopic pregnancy to cause a spontaneous abortion? And the answer is, I'm going to say no. And let me tell you why. And, and then, okay, so the ectopic pregnancy is not within that centralized area of the uterus, right? So I, I think you're asking, can they can they lose the, uh, can maybe if it was located up in the cornua or an area like that, can it be expulsed? Um, the answer, the, in, and by spontaneous abortion, can it come through the, the uterus? I'm gonna say most likely no, but it can be expulsed out into the belly. So let's say they have a ectopic pregnancy, you have an ectopic pregnancy in the tube, it can be um, what we call ruptured and go right into your belly. And that is one of the major causes of maternal death and hemorrhage, okay? Um, so hopefully I answered that question. Okay, next question. How do you manage the high emotions that come with and when a baby doesn't make it? you know that this this hit home because I've, i actually experienced this within the last 24 hours and um at the end of the day you just have to remember that even though you're a physician you are human <laughs> okay and um i can't express that how important it is that you maintain relationships with your nurses with your your friends from residency and your, you know, just your colleagues, because the emotions that I'm showing now, <laughs> you don't want to show them in front of your patient because you want to be strong. So, um, you know, just the fact of the matter is you, you are human, okay? And um, rely on your support system. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it's okay to, to, to cry with the patient because you will have, you will notoriously have, um, or you go all the way to the end of pregnancy and um, a pregnancy is lost. And um, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> I didn't expect that question. But you will um, just know that you can do it. You've had enough schooling. And if you're doing this for the right reason, you'll be able to make it through. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, the next question is, why do some women have to carry the fetus to term, even though it has been determined that the fetus is deceased? Okay, let me make sure I understand your question. Okay. Why do some women have to carry the fetus to term, even though it has been determined that the fetus is deceased? Okay, I'm not exactly sure why, I, if I understand your question, because um, once a fetus has lost its heartbeat, even in even in your you know Catholic um, Protestant hospitals, you are allowed to conduct an induction of labor. Um, so I don't know if that question came from the United States. Maybe I don't know if I maybe don't, don't understand that question. Um, but at the end, you'll see my email um, and I lips my Instagram. So if you want to contact me, hopefully I can get you a, a better answer to that. Okay. I have had a patient who, um, I've had a few patients who were like trisomy 18. Um, and um, they, they, you know, you, sometimes you, you know that these fetuses won't go on to, they won't go on to deliver. However, um, they, the, the fetus is not deceased. So I, um, yeah, just contact me offline and we can talk more about that. What are the major ethical issues you experience in the field? So I think major ethical issues. And when I think of ethics, I think, you know, right versus wrong. Are you doing the best thing for each patient? Um, oh, that's a great question. major ethical issues. Sometimes I like to think about these questions because that's one that mm, 
Yeah, I might have to think about that because and if you have a specific example, so you're going to have you're going to have so many issues. You're going to have patients who come to the hospital and um, sometimes, well, I mean, here's, here's one. Um, you'll have a patient who comes in and they're in, let's say, hypertensive emergency or they're in just a very critical state and you are having trouble stabilizing them. But once you stabilize them, you have to get the babies out. Okay. So you have to deliver the babies. So um, sometimes you have to do it at the expense of, um, it's the only way to stabilize the mom. So if, you, if you're familiar with preeclampsia and eclampsia, the treatment for preeclampsia is delivery of the fetus, especially if it's greater than, um, let's say 34 weeks. Um, so, you, but you know, what if that occurs at 28 weeks? And I've seen it happen at 28 weeks, I've seen it happen much earlier. So do you deliver the fetus knowing that the fetus is going to be in the NICU for the next two to three months? Um, and so I think, you know, sometimes just trying to maneuver and, and think of taking care of the mother However, also um, doing what's best for the infant. But in, in, in essence, if you don't have, you know, you ha mom has to be healthy in order to have the babies healthy. So, so I guess trying to make that decision is, is it better for me to deliver the babies, um, to stabilize mom and then deliver the babies or stabilize mom and see if the babies will live within, in, inside of her? Um, yeah. Some of my colleagues have had to do post, post um, they call them post, postmortem. Uh, C-sections and, and thankfully I've never had to do that. So, all right. Um, okay. Question. Could you give a brief background on your path to medical school residency? Okay. Um, so I love this question because this is my second career. Um, I, I went to undergrad at Indiana University and that was many moons ago and um, came out not exactly sure what I wanted to do. My major, I have a bachelor's of science in biology and my initial job out of resident or out of undergrad, I, this story is gonna amaze you, but I worked in IT um, and I worked for a large um, Blue Cross Blue Shield in the Midwest. And the reason why I did that was when I worked in, um, when I was, okay, <sighs> how do I tell this story? Okay, y'all, so let me start, okay. So initially I wanted to go to dental school, okay? <laughs> and so that path just didn't happen. So as you, you guys are gonna see my quote down below and that's kind of where it came from. So I was the, the kid that walked into undergrad thinking they were gonna major in biology or chemistry and took the first class and said, absolutely not. This is not going to happen. I'm not smart enough for this. Okay. And so um, many moons later. And so I started working out in the labs, in the computer labs in undergrad. And that's how I, once the dental school thing didn't pan out, I started, that's where I started working, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, and so I did that for six years. And during that time frame, what I did is I retook every chemistry class up until organic chemistry. So I retook C105, 125, 106, 126. I took anatomy and physiology. And all of this while working, already having had my degree, because I knew that I needed to refine my skills and I needed to learn how I learn. Okay. And this is really, really important for anyone, anyone who's facing, facing hardships or anyone who feels discouraged, know that if you're 22 or and you want to go straight to medical school or dental school or something like that, that, that doesn't mean the door is closed, but you have to learn, you have to know how you learn, okay? And so um, it took for me take, retaking those classes, which I aced the second time around. I don't think there's one course I took that I didn't get an A in. Um, and I found out that I'm a visual learner, okay? So that's why like during my, my little um, speech today, you didn't see many words, it was mostly diagrams. That's how I learn. So you have to learn how you learn. So once I figured that out, I then um, 
I, by that time I've been in corporate America for six years, I put my house up for sale and I did a post baccalaureate program at Southern Illinois called med prep. I did two years of that where I basically took anatomy, physiology, histology, microbiology, all before my first year of medical school. So by the time I got to medical school, no, it wasn't a breeze, but I had, I had much, a lot of exposure to my first year of medical school. I'd already um, dissected an entire cadaver, okay? Um, so I did my four years of medical school and then I um, matched into OBGYN at Meharry Medical College and did my four year residency there and then yeah, and so you know, I took what step one, two, and then once you get into medical residency, it's um, USMLE one, two, three, and then for um, for OBGYN, you have to take your written, written and oral boards. So believe you me, it's just the beginning. Okay, <laughs> okay. All right. What is your favorite thing about being an OBGYN, and how you decide on this specialty? What is my favorite thing? My favorite thing is every time I meet a new patient, it's a new experience. And, and I don't know, you know, how you feel about your, if you believe in a higher power or something like that, but just being, I feel it is a gift to be able to be involved in bringing um, life on, onto earth. Okay. So it's, um, and then sharing in that with the family. I, I don't take that lightly. And I, I think that's the most important thing and the thing that I, I enjoy the most. So if I had to cho choose between GYN and OB, I would always choose OB. Um, but at the same time, I do like being a surgeon as well. So um, I think that hopefully that. Uh, um, so how did I decide on the specialty? It was very hard for me. Okay. And I didn't narrow it down until like my fourth year of medical school. I, I remember the first baby that I helped deliver and that was actually in, uh, someone that I was, I believe I was shadowing. I believe I was shadowing before medical school and that really, really stood out to me. And my fourth year medical school, I, I got some really discouraging words from someone who's um, on his way to be a neurosurgeon. He's like, you don't want to go into this, this, and this, you know, you're not going to make any money, blah, 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 blah. So my fourth year, fourth year medical school, I, I took time and did um, a trip to um, El Direct, Kenya with the Indiana University um, exchange program there. And I was able to uh, work with pediatrics, internal medicine. And although I didn't work with the, the uh, OBGYNs, I always went over there so I could see the babies and you're going to see a lot more pathology in third world countries. And I just gravitated towards them. So I kind of knew, you know, um, this is that that was the field for me. Okay, help you. If a woman were to be HIV positive or have any other contagious blood disease, how would you change the birth plan? Okay, so that's a very that's very um, a very great a good very good question. Um, I have practiced in Atlanta, Georgia, which has a fairly um, high HIV positive population, and what we've done, um, Emory has a a program for HIV patients. Um, we've also taken care of them in our clinics, so we will start them on antiretrovirals early in pregnancy, um, and we'll get their viral load early in pregnancy. Um, their partner can also be treated, or you know. Um, their partner can also receive medicine. So like prep, the PrEP pill, if you've ever heard of that. Um, and so it may be PrEP, it may be, I think there's pre-exposure and then there's um, post-exposure, but yeah, I think it's PrEP. So the, their partner can also be treated. And so when you, you want to um, co-manage them with an infectious disease physician and maternal fetal medicine, because um, there, you know, the fetus is at risk of having HIV as well. However, we do several things. So we plan the delivery at about 38 weeks so that it's before rupture membranes. Um, we start AZT, which is zidovudine, which is a, um, it's in the antiretroviral family. I believe it has um, antiretroviral and they have like rescript re taste inhibitors, so on, yeah, <laughs> don't quote me. But um, we start that prior to delivery. 
And um, we also check the patient's viral load. So if her viral load is below 1,000, she should be able to do a vaginal delivery. If it's above 1,000, then we recommend a cesarean section. Um, and so that's it. And I believe the baby is placed on, I don't know how many months of um, prophylaxis, but the baby re receives a prophylaxis at birth as well. That's a great question. What is something you wish all women knew about pregnancy? No, pregnancy is the same. <laughs> okay. So, and I mean, that's very rudimentary, but you have patients who come in and they think one pregnancy is going to be like the other pregnancy and it's not. And, um, and so don't, don't feel like something's wrong because one pregnancy is not like the other, but they're all very, very common. Um, also, I think just because of how I got a little emotional earlier, but I wish that each doctor and midwife, it's, you know, et cetera, talk to patients about kit counts because it's very, very important. So especially in that third trimester of pregnancy, you should not go two hours without feeling your baby. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> what does a patient with two uteruses do? Do they keep them and what would they do for birth control? That's a great question. Um, Yes, they keep both of them. And then you also want to look for renal or kidney abnormalities because um, in, um, what's the word I'm looking for? In, in um, embryology, the kidneys and the uterus are related. So um, birth control, they can, you can get two, UI, two, two IUDs. Um, you can go on birth control pills. Um, so, yeah, you just have to be cognizant that there are two, but any of the birth controls should work. They can do a, um, you know, next one on patch. Okay. Everyone is so sorry to hear this and sending love and hugs. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm so sorry. And it just shows you, you know, it's, so, it's okay to be human. You, you're going to have your human <laughs> moments. And so um, thank you for that. Everyone is appreciative of your hard work and being honest about your emotions. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of you are amazing coming in. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, have you ever had a situation where you disagree with the patient's medical decision? All the time. <laughs> um, so a lot of our patients are, um, some of your patients, um, aren't going to agree with your decisions. And, you know, the thing about medicine is it's a practice and it's a, you know, they call it a shared decision-making process. So sometimes um, patients might want to do what, what they, you know, they want to do their own thing. Um, I had a patient come in with an IUD and I think when she first got the IUD placed, she was maybe 300 and 50 pounds and she gained weight and she was now 400 and she said it's due to her IUD. So she wants her IUD out. Um, however, I know that women who are 400 pounds have an increased risk of unopposed estrogen bleeding. And so she's increasing her risk of endometrial cancer, which is counter counteracted with the progesterone from the IUD. However, you know, when a patient wants what they want, you have to, you have to, um, you have to honor their autonomy. Okay. Their own decision making skills. But yes, very often, very often. What is the GP notation for twins and triplets? Okay, that's a good question. So um, uh, TPAL, is that right? So the G is how many times has, you, has your gravid? So the, 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 the G stands for gravid and gravid. And so that's like, how many times have you been pregnant? So that's a very generic number. So that number is not going to change um, with twins and triplets. Okay. Because that person was only, even though if they have triplets, they were only pregnant once. And then P, I only showed you just one of the numbers, but there's actually four. <laughs> and T stands for term. Um, T or the next one is preterm. The, and the next uh, number is abortions. And the next number is um, living. So T P A L term, preterm abortions and living. So these numbers here, the T P A L T P A, um, those are really not going to change with, with, um, twins. However, the living is that number is going to go up. So if you have a 
um, a person who's had only one set of twins, one set of twins, they're going to be a G1P P1002. So the living, because they have they have uh, more than one living, if that makes sense. And it's very, very confusing. It's confusing for probably all residents <laughs> and medical school students. So it's something that um, eventually you will, you will um, think of and understand. Okay, and what is the best position to give birth? Back, standing up, or all fours? Great question. Um, I think you can, if you don't have an epidural, you go right ahead and do whatever you want. <laughs> you can, um, well, standing up might be a little hard because you you wanna, the way the pelvis works is we have a position called Mick Roberts. And Mick Roberts, what you wanna do is hyperflex the thighs or the legs on the maternal thigh. And what that does is that opens up the pelvis, okay? And so that gives more, more room for the fetus to come out. Now, a lot of times when you'll see women on their, um, you know, on all fours or on one side or another side, we call that decubitus, um, right and left decubitus, they are, um, they're trying to turn the baby, okay? Or they're trying to thin out a certain part of the cervix or rotate the baby, okay? But yeah, all of that, um, all of those are, are viable positions. I, I, when I deliver, I use the back, patient on the back. And the reason being is because I've seen enough of shoulder dystocias to know that for me to get in and get the baby out, being on your back is a good position for me. Um, could you talk a little bit about your work-life balance? <laughs> And um, this answer may be different for a male, but as a female, um, if you do, or if you plan to go into this field, my recommendation would be that you go, that you join a very large group. And by very large, I mean eight or more, if you can, if you can get into a very large group, because that's going to dictate your call schedule and that's going to dictate the type of life you have. Okay. Um, we're all considered, we, we all have to do weekends. So if you get into a group of four, you're going to go on call every fourth weekend. Um, and if you go on, if you go into a call of eight, then you're going to go on call, weekend call every, you know, once every two months. And then you may go on call during the week, every one to two days. Um, so call is, is um, rotated. I have done it all. Okay. Um, I have initially when I came out of residency, I was the only OBGYN in a clinic. Don't do that. <laughs> um, and then when I moved to Atlanta, I only did, um, I was part of a call group, but we didn't, we took our own call during the week. And um, so that, that meant, you know, you're not, you're not going to go to the gym and swim because you got to be near your phone. Right. So um, that's nerve wracking. Um, and so now I've chosen a, a position where I do laborious jobs. I do, well, uh, well, let's say I did locum tenum for a year and that means you go out. So let's say you, let's say you're studying for boards, which is, which is what I was doing. So I was studying for oral boards. Okay. I'd already passed written. So I did locum tenum and, and locum tenum is Latin for temporary doctor. I don't know, <laughs> traveling. So I'd go in, um, and I'd, let's say I knew I was taking a board prep course for um, a week in October. And so what I do is I would accept a locum tenant job maybe for two weeks at the end of October. So that is, um, that's an option as well. And I just travel to that job and they pay for everything. They pay for your hotel, they pay for your, your flight, your rental car. And then you just go home after that. Um, and then you're considered an independent contractor. Now I have, I work um, as a laborist position and this is a very viable option. However, you have to be able to kind of give up more of your GYN, which is kind of, is, is not as fun because it makes you a little bit less marketable and it, um, you might lose your skills. Okay. You, so, um, with the labor's position, I am on call. Like today, I'm on call Friday. No, let's go back. Uh, yeah, today I'm okay. So I started calls 24 hours last Sunday, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I did all evenings seven to seven. Today, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I am on call 24 hours, and then next week I'm on call um, maybe 
12 hours each day for three days. That's what I chose. <laughs> okay. You don't have to do something like that, but think of this for the rest of the month. I am free. I can do whatever I want. So, um, I don't have children now, but if you are looking to have children a little bit earlier or young, you know, younger and have a, you know, pretty viable social life, become part of a, a large call group. Okay. <sighs> okay. I think I have totally talked and um, I, I thank you all for letting my, me express myself. My statement here was, as you start your medical journey and you encounter a closed door, look for an open window. Um, I have never let anyone tell me no. Um, as you can see, I get emotional, but <laughs> not all the time. So I just want to tell anyone, if you're a career changer like me, if you're struggling or if you're at the top of your class, it doesn't matter. If someone tells you no, just look for a different avenue because you can still get to where you want to be. Okay. And that's the end. I just, um, there's my email and my IG page. I expect I'm, I'm only at 300 followers. So I expect by the end of the day, I'll be at a thousand because I want you <laughs> to follow me. Um, and I really do thank um, Web Shadowers for this opportunity. Um, and please, 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 please stay in touch and, and good luck to all of you. You will be, you will be great physicians. Don't let anyone tell you any differently. Okay. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Broswell. This was an absolutely amazing presentation. Thank Everyone you. is so appreciative of your honesty and your transparency and everyone learned so much. So we really, really appreciate you taking the time to do this and answer all of our questions. Um, everyone, for all our viewers, thank you all for joining this session. The Google form to track your attendance has been posted in the chat box and keep an eye out. It'll be posted in the this video's description shortly. Um, remember that you now have to get three out of four questions correct and provide a valid summary to get credit. And yeah, thank you so much again.